we can test that now or after the announcements. <laughs> um, but the first announcement I wanted to make was that Haley Sandana, um, a trainee from Stages Cohort 1, will be defending her thesis tomorrow, 2.30 p.m. There is a Zoom link also. I will forward this to everybody. Um, her title for her defense is in C2 and remote sensing of aerosol properties and their influences in tropical oceanic warm rain systems. So um, we invite everybody to come and show support for um, one of our students that will be defending and graduating this term. Uh, the next announcement is just the upcoming workshop schedule. Today we have NOAA Fisheries, the Southeast Region, um, Species Conservation Branch joining us. Um, and then next week, we have Coastal Bend Bays and Estuaries Program, uh, followed by Texas Parks and Wildlife Department, uh, Texas General Land Office, Ingleside on the Bay Coastal Watch Association, the Mission Aransas National Estuarine Research Reserve, and Texas Living Waters Project at the end of April, and Texas Water Development Board at the beginning of May. And all of the workshops are on Mondays from 12 to 2 p.m. Um, there is the Zoom link. It's actually the same Zoom link for all of them. Um, and all of them, except for next week's April 1st, are here in HRI 127. Uh, next week's, I need to visit the two rooms that are available and see which one would better suit us. Um, but it's either going to be in the O'Connor Building or the University Center. Um, so... With that, I will stop sharing. Um, and if you want to see if you can share your screen. OK, we can see it. OK, I'm just going to take myself off a mute then. <laughs> um, so hello, everybody. Um, my name is Calusa Horn. I'm happy to speak with you today, along with my colleagues about Jerry Manta Rays. Um, so in general, I'm going to provide you an overview of kind of who we are and what we do, followed by an overview of the species, um, its threats, and why it was listed under the Endangered Species Act. Um, then I'm going to pass it over to my colleagues, um, Dr. Nick Farmer and Dr. Christian Jones, and we'll be able to discuss some more about, about our current conservation efforts and our research needs. So you're going to hear me say next slide because Nick is hosting, doing the presentation for me, and I'm just over here. Okay, so next slide. <laughs> All right, so just to kind of orient you to who we are, we work at NOAA Fisheries. Um, Nick and I work in the Southeast Regional Office, which is located in St. Petersburg, Florida, and Christian Jones works in the Southeast Fisheries Science Center, which is in Pascagoula, Mississippi. Together, NOAA Fisheries, the Southeast Region, and the Southeast Fisheries Science Center work to protect marine life and their habitats. Through policy management and public outreach, we strive to ensure the recovery and survival of protected species for future generations in waters of the Southeast United States. This includes Puerto Rico and the U.S. Virgin Islands. Um, to do this, we implement the Marine Mammal Protection Act and the Endangered Species Act. Um, this helps us protect species, threatened and endangered species like the giant manta ray that we're talking about today. So next slide. So I wanted to familiarize you with um, the giant manta ray, this really cool species. Um, it was listed under the Endangered Species Act as threatened species in 2018. Um, it is the largest ray in the world. Um, its wingspan are what we call its disc -wist. Disc width, which is measured from wing tip to wing tip, is um, estimated the largest ones are up to 26 feet. Um, we see an average size ranging between 13 and 16 feet. Um, females age at maturity is estimated to be about 8.6 years. The average female is believed to produce four to seven pups during her entire lifetime. Um, the maximum age is estimated to be about 45 years, and that's um, based on reef manta rays life history parameters, which we know a lot more about reef manta ray than we do about giant manta rays, so we make some assumptions based on reef manta ray. Um, the, the species has a very conservative life history, um, low fecundity, late maturing, um, which makes it extremely vulnerable to population declines and less likely to recover from any removals. 
manta rays are filter feeders. They predominantly feed on zooplankton. Um, they can occur, they, they primarily occur offshore, but they can be found in near shore coastal waters, typically productive coastal areas. And in the Southeast, we find them in coastal bays, um, ocean inlets, and in estuaries. Kind of a global perspective of their range here. Um, they're found worldwide, tropical, subtropical, and temperate bodies of water, um, offshore, near shore, and in coast, um, productive coastal areas. Um, in the Southeast, they occur in the Atlantic, uh, Gulf of Mexico, and Caribbean. Um, this map um, from Mantra Trust here kind of shows um, their confirmed range, um, which is the dark blue area and the lighter areas, um, essentially the extent of their range or their expected range. So next slide. So threats, um, this is one of the reason coupled with those vulnerable life history characteristics that I just talked about, the threats is why the species was listed under the Endangered Species Act. Um, giant manta rays threatened with extinction through a host of threats, but most significantly, um, the most significant threat is the artisanal and commercial fisheries. Um, and giant manta rays are both targeted and caught as bycatch in a number of global fisheries throughout the range. They are primarily targeted for their gill plates, which are used in tra traditional Chinese medicine, similar to shark fins and shark fin soup. Um, the demand for the gill plates has resulted in significant population declines, up to 95% in some locations, but most notably in the Indo-Pacific Ocean. They are caught as bycatch in various fisheries also. Um, this includes um, persane, longline, gillnet, trawl fisheries. Um, but besides the, those threats posed by the fisheries, they are also subject to vessel strikes, which is an increasing common, increasingly common in areas of high vessel traffic, like in Southeast Florida, we see a lot of vessel strikes, Miami-Dade County area. Um, they are also um, become entangled in vertical lines, um, such as buoys or mooring lines, but really any kind of line, vertical line in the water, um, they tend to run into them and then they tend to spiral and that creates an entanglement around their syphilic lobes typically. These types of entanglement can rapidly lead to asphyxiation and death for them. Um, other threats include um, plastics and pollutants in the water. Um, while they're filter feeding, they can ingest these microplastics and large plastics. Um, once they do that, it can um, prevent digestion and damage the digestive tracts and really is not very good for them at all. All right, next slide. So I uh, kind of giving you an overview of a kind of why it was listed under the Endangered Species Act and the threats. We're going to talk about a little bit about the species identification and some of the challenges since the species was listed um, in improving data collection and identification of this animal. Um, Prior to the species being listed, it was not really large rays in general, weren't really identified down to the species level. Um, so in the Southeast, we had several rays um, that are commonly misidentified as them. They're as birosterus, manta birosterus. Um, this includes mobi mobula hypostoma, terrapicana, and mobula mobular. You can kind of see there. Um, I don't really understand the terrapicana one. It's more brown, but it is a large ray. And so um, if you don't know a lot, then you can misidentify it and lump it in as a giant manta ray or manta ray. So in the next couple of slides, I'm going to go ahead and talk about some of the distinguishing characteristics of manta rays in particular, because that's why we're here. Um, so the easiest way to distinguish manta rays is based on their size. They are the largest ray that you're going to find. Um, like I said, the max size is about 26 feet. Um, but again, we're seeing 13 to 16 feet, under 20 feet um, typically. But the key features are really those white shoulder markings on the dorsal side. So these markings form two mirror images, kind of right angle, right angle triangles that create a T on the, in black on their um, shoulders there. They have two large syphilic lobes um, or fins at the front of their mouth, which when they unfurl when they're eating, they create, they kind of center and almost touch in the center of the mouth and that helps them funnel prey um, into the mouth and increase foraging. Um, they are also the only manta ray found in our in the southeast region. 
are in the Gulf of Mexico in Atlantic. So that helps. Next slide. Okay, so one of the other neat things is that while they're typically or are that black and white coloring, we do have some dorsal patterning that happens there. So there's some variation here. So you'll see in these pictures, um, some of them have very white um, on their pictorial fins, um, some additional white markings, and then you have one that's almost completely black. And I believe these animals were all captured in the Southeast, in the Atlantic or Gulf of Mexico or Caribbean. So next slide. Um, so now that we've covered the dorsal side, we'll talk about the ventral side, I guess. Um, this is the ventral side, the belly side of the animal. One of the really amazing things about manta rays is that each manta ray has a unique spot pattern on its ventral side. Um, this spot pattern remains largely unchanged throughout their lives. Um, much like a fingerprint, this unique nature of these spots enables us scientists and researchers to identify individual manta rays just by photographing their ventral surfaces. Um, every manta ID, whether it's a new manta or a resighting of a known manta individual, our individual informs an important piece of a, like a pretty big jigsaw puzzle <laughs> essentially. Um, over time, this information can re reveal uh, migration patterns, habitat, critical habitat use, feeding areas, reproduction, and much more. Um, and we use that information to kind of inform our management decisions around con the conservation of the species. So that was a lot said very quickly. Um, and I will gonna go ahead at this point in time and hand it over to Nick to talk about more about this in depth about the species habitat um, and distribution. All right. Thank you all for joining us today. I'm excited to talk to you a little bit about uh, one of my favorite species. So one of the things that we did early on in the process after giant manta ray were listed is we started to look at, okay, they're listed. Do they occur in our region? And if so, where? And I was surprised to see, cause I, you know, I've been in Florida for a long time. I'd never seen a manta ray, never really heard of anyone who'd seen a manta ray, but in fact, Giant manta rays are seen um, both along both coasts of Florida, but also throughout the southeast. Um, I wouldn't say commonly, but there are some areas where they do seem to gather uh, with greater frequency. And so we tried to assimilate all the different data sources that were available um, and put them into a species distribution modeling context. Um, looking at whether there was some predictive nature with regards to areas of high productivity. Um, trying to understand nearshore versus offshore distributions. And in addition, shortly after the listing, we've had now two publications, one at Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary, where if you can see my mouse is located here, about 100 miles off of Galveston, Texas, so fairly close to y'all. And then also off the east, east coast of Florida that are nursery areas for giant manta rays which is pretty fascinating. I think within the U.S., they're the only documented giant manta ray nursery areas. Um, so we have a fairly substantial obligation to protect the species in U.S. waters, and it starts in those locations. So you can see all the various data sources that we've pulled together. I won't go through the acronyms, but, but suffice to say there were quite a few, and uh, published a paper on it and nature scientific reports and fit a species distribution model to it. And it showed that bathymetric slope, water temperature, chlorophyll A, um, and a variety of other factors were useful predictors for where giant manta ray would occur. And one thing I want you to see here is the, uh, the heat map changes with seasonality. Um, Hotter colors denote areas where there's a higher predicted presence of giant manta ray. And those crosses and X's that you're seeing popping up are the actual positive observations used to inform the species distribution model. Um, I believe that the pluses are data that was used to inform the model and the X's are data that's independent of the model. And uh, generally the model showed excellent fits both internally and externally to different data sources. So, it's a fairly useful, useful predictive model. It's really helped us quite a bit in terms of narrowing in on when we should do uh, research expeditions to particular locations um, and what direction to head out of, even out of the, uh, 
the marina. Um, so that's been great. It's also helped us inform what's called our ESA or Endangered Species Act Section 7 consultation process, which is uh, an obligation that we have as an office to um, evaluate any action that's permitted, funded, or carried out by the federal government to determine if it's likely to jeopardize the continued existence of giant manta rays. So knowing where they are relative to things that people would like to do in the water uh, is very helpful. So let me see if I can get moving here. Um, another thing that we've done beyond the species distribution model is we've begun a uh, satellite and acoustic tagging effort. Um, our goal is to better characterize those nursery habitats to quantify site fidelity, meaning if a manta ray is in a location, how long is it there? How often does it return? Um, as you can imagine, for quantifying the impact of human activities, that's a pretty important factor. What's the likelihood the thing's even there in the first place? And then what's the duration of it being there as a fairly mobile animal relative to how long the human activity is going on? Um, another big thing that we're trying to do is to quantify what's called availability bias from our species distribution model. So the model that I just showed you was a probability of occurrence model, which is kind of like a habitat suitability. But that same data can be used to inform an abundance estimate if you can get at two parameters. And the first parameter you can get at from mark recapture aerial surveys. So basically, as you're looking down from an airplane, you have what's called perception bias, which means that it's harder to see a giant manta ray the further the giant manta ray is away from the track line that you're flying over. So we can quantify that fairly well, but one thing that we don't have really any information on or didn't was availability bias. That is, how much of its time would a giant manta ray spend within the visible layers of the water column? So you figure an aerial observer can probably see maybe one meter, sometimes two meters deep into the water. So if a giant manta ray is below those depths, it won't be seen, and so it won't be recorded. And so your estimate of giant manta ray abundance would be a, a major underestimate due to the percentage of time that manta rays in general would be spending at depth. So we're working on quantifying those things with satellite and uh, acoustic tags. So here's just uh, a few of our satellite tag tracks to show you a bit with regards to the movements through time. And I apologize, this video is probably a little wonky on your end, um, but what you're seeing is the movements of three different giant manta rays through three-dimensional space along the east coast of Florida. Um, and they're moving basically within both nearshore and offshore environments. They're making dives down to depth in different locations. They tend to dive deeper in deeper water, which makes a lot of intuitive sense. And uh, so that, that work has been fairly informative and interesting. And then, hold on, jumping ahead of ourselves here. Okay. And then uh, within Flower Garden Banks National Marine Sanctuary, we were fortunate to get a uh, tag on this fellow right here who came awfully close to the diver before getting tagged. He's very curious, um, probably regrets that. But um, anyway, here's the, uh, the animation of that movement. So this is through an array that's been set out by Texas A&M University. So uh, a place near and dear to you guys. And uh, these are movements through um, I believe West Flower Garden Bank. And so this is acoustic tagging uh, data here. So your tag locations are gonna be determined by receiver placements in terms of where you're getting your position fixes. Those receivers are gonna record every time that the manta ray passes within range and it'll send out a unique signal code that'll be recorded with a date and time stamp on that receiver. And, uh, so looking at the satellite tagging data, again, flipping back to that, this is sort of a suite of profiles from some of our early tagging efforts. So you can see profiles of wildly varying duration. Um, the longevity of a tag staying on a giant manta ray probably depends a whole lot on the giant manta ray's behavior. Sometimes they like to jump out of the water, breach, land really hard on their back. Tags placed on the back don't tend to stay on very well when they do that. Um, and you see the uh, color coding, so that's showing the temperature, and then the vertical axis here is depth. So you'll see that, you know, generally you've got warm surface waters, cooler, deeper waters, 
and the manta rays are showing uh, use of both of those habitats, um, sometimes with a pretty clear trend where they're using deep habitat and then they've gone shallow for a while and then they're using deep again. Um, one thing that really stood out to me is the one manta ray I have on here that was tagged in the Gulf of Mexico, this one here, um, had a very distinct day and night pattern where there was very little use of those surface waters relative to some of our east coast of Florida giant manta rays, which are the other ones that are shown. So there seems to be some different space use patterns um, depending on the location that the ray is tagged in. Um, and so that's an important thing to understand both from uh, impacts from human activities and from uh, availability bias estimation perspective. So I'm going to turn it over to Christian now, and he's going to get into the meat of what we are asking you guys to potentially help us with. All right. Thanks, Nick. Um, hopefully you guys can hear me. I'm going to stay dark because I got bandwidth issues on my end, so I'm going to keep my video off. But uh, yeah, so um, Nick and Calusa have kind of run through what's been done so far, and, and um, I think you know, while the, the one map that was up there with our sightings data may look like there's quite a bit of, um, of sightings on there, it's, there's really um, not a whole lot of data out there. Those are sightings are actually uh, pretty limited compared to a lot of other species we have. So, you know, one of the things that we're looking at is how can we get more data um, on the distribution and, and movement patterns of, of these species and mantas in particular, um, are quite data limited um, in that respect. So there's a lot of sort of tangential efforts going on right now as far as using AI and, and machine learning um, to uh, analyze satellite imagery um, for different uh, species of interest. Um, so using it for things like large whales has been, um, you know, a historic usage of, of satellite imagery. Um, and within NOAA even, um, there's been for several years now, this Gaia project, geospatial artificial intelligence for animals that's been going on, that's predominantly been focused on North Atlantic right whales um, in off the Northeast and then belugas um, up in uh, Alaska. And um, um, in addition to this, we recently received quite a bit of funding through Inflation Reduction Act to sort of continue and expand those efforts um, uh, into other species. Um, so they'll continue to do North Atlantic right whales and belugas, but also adding things in like uh, blue whales off of the East Coast. And then we're looking at potentially rices, whales and leatherbacks in, in um, the Gulf of Mexico. Uh, expand sort of the, the number of species that are included in that sort of uh, Gaia initiative project. In addition to that, we're also looking at potentially, um, hopefully getting some funding to do a dynamic modeling program here for the Gulf of Mexico um, through Restore Fundings. And what that would do would be to bring in various sources of data um, um, to look at species distribution models um, bring in species distribution models as well as oceanographic data to provide information uh, um, updated, hopefully daily, um, to fishers and managers to sort of direct fishers into areas where they can enhance the catch of their target species while reducing bycatch. And of course, these protected species that we're talking about, manta rays included, are, are important in reducing um, those bycatch because that's one of the, um, especially in the northern Gulf of Mexico, we see um, some significant bycatch in certain fisheries. And one of the um, data streams that we're hoping to include in some of this dynamic modeling is detections from satellite imagery. Um, and then finally, a, a sort of a brand new initiative that's come out of our protected resources um, group is this ASTER-3, which is, stands for Advanced Sampling and Technology for Extinction Risk Reduction and Recovery. Um, and so there are several, and you can see on the, the um, right-hand side of the, the screen there, that little flower schematic there with, with the different petals. And the whole point of ASTER-3 
master three to bring in a bunch of using imagery and AI ML along with other things like uncrewed systems and, and omics and, and um, passive and active acoustics um, to gather more data on these uh, protected resources. And so one of the um, hopes for Astra 3 is that we can continue to fund um, and promote some of these projects using these te technologies. Um, next slide, Nick. And so sort of specific to manta rays, what we're hoping to do um, is take what has been done for some of these other species and, and apply it specifically to manta rays. So up until now, like I mentioned before, most of the current and ongoing efforts are um, focused on the large whales, um, North Atlantic right whales and belugas specifically, historically, and then um, future plans or even current plans uh, moving on to blue whales, uh, rices whales, leatherback sea turtles. So more of the species in the spotlight type of uh, protected species. But currently there are no specific plans for mantas. Uh, I've pushed and, and promoted um, mantas for you know future efforts, um, but obviously there are more um, spotlighted species that that's tend to get priorities um, the larger whales and, and sea turtles specifically so what we're trying to pull together is sort of a a manta specific effort the problem with mantas specifically with satellite imagery is well first of all you can see them in satellite imagery it's kind of hard to see but that is a manta ray in the middle of that image in the lower right hand corner and, um, uh, but again, because of the limited number of observations to this point, it's kind of hard to, with North Atlantic right whales and belugas, we've got so much sighting data that it's, that it's easier to pinpoint areas where the these organisms are moving through or where they might be at any given point in time. So it's a little bit easier to amass satellite imagery for um, training data because artificial intelligence, machine learning requires quite a bit of, of training data um, to uh, train the computers to be able to, to detect these things from the imagery. Um, Unfortunately, we don't have you know that for manta rays at this point in time. We don't have it for a lot of species. There's actually very few species where, where we have that type of species-specific training um, data set. And there is the potential to downsample aerial imagery to use for, for training um, imagery. It's not ideal, but uh, that is one potential step. Um, the step that I've promoted and, and, have, and I think that we're moving towards because it's going to get us not just manta rays, but um, additional species is, is using what I generally call a general ocean anomaly detector. So um, you're basically training the AI to provide you with data on anything that's not just water, land, waves, that type of stuff. Um, and so ultimately that's going to give us imagery training data sets for not just mantas but you know boats are you know being able to count boats in some areas um, at time at times is important for fisheries um, of course uh, groups of dolphins schools of even large fish you know in some cases uh, could be detected uh, using satellite imagery so generating sort of this general ocean anomaly detector it's going to provide us, it's going to be more work on the front end because it's going to require experts going through all of these detections to actually determine what is actually in those imagery. And there's probably going to be a lot of things like waves and, and white caps and that type of stuff at first. But as we go through and we can then refine and annotate those images and then feed them back into the AI models, um, the AI and the ML models, then we can um, further refine those uh, those algorithms so that they become you know, more and more accurate, uh, and then weed out some of those those uh, extemporaneous things. And so, ultimately, that's what we're looking to do with this project. Is um, 
and I think we already we might have already located some code for this general ocean anomaly detect. Um, and need to be refined quite a bit more, and then, but um, that's what we're looking for ultimately is to to sort of be able to use this general ocean anomaly detector, hopefully to um, be able to pull out um, uh, manta ray detections from from satellite imagery. And at, at right now, um, focusing in on places like the Flower Garden Banks, where we know, you know, we have quite a bit of, of sightings, quite a bit of activity, at least below the water. Um, it'll be interesting to see if we can get, you know, detections from the satellite imagery of what what's hanging out at the surface and, and how much they're hanging out at the surface as well. Um, and then, you know, any sort of AI ML um, detector um, that we can generate could then be more broadly applied to to the northern Gulf and then um, other areas as well. So that's that's all I have, Nick. Thanks for that, Christian. And I'll, I'll just add on to that, that, you know, flower gardens is a really interesting test case as well, because as a nursery area, there's a lot we don't know about it with regards to, you know, for example, when the big pregnant females are coming, you know, to flower gardens or near flower gardens to reproduce. And so it'd be pretty fascinating to see if, you know, from the satellite imagery, which is kind of continuous, if you could pinpoint some of that life history in addition to just getting a sense of more, more understanding of the winds and wares for giant manta rays in that area. So let's flip to the next one and let's just uh, I'll hold for questions. So we are available for any questions you have. I was wondering, um, in terms of the data that's available, um, if you could just clarify, so is it like satellite imaging that's looking for the anomalies or is it running the code? I just wanted to further understand like what the available data looks like. So um, there is some code that's been generated, I believe, um, not again, not specific to Mantis, but I think there is code available um, that is, is at least the, the beginnings of sort of this ocean anomaly detector. Um, as far as I know, there's been nothing specific to, to Mantis yet for detecting Mantis within satellite imagery. Um, now, there has been some work, I think, and Nick, you can correct me if I'm wrong, um, on aerial imagery um, for detecting. I mean, I don't know if, that, again, I don't know if it's specific to Mantis, but um, there's been um, several companies that have done aerial um, surveys that have used AI at least to pull out organisms um, out of out of the, the imagery that, that they've collected. Um, as far as the imagery is concerned, uh, we, I think so far, I think we've been using Maxar um, imagery within the government. We actually have a, a an agreement with Maxar where, where we have, I think, um, access to most of their unclassified satellite imagery, um, even, you know, beyond what I think what's, what's available to the public. So, um, yeah, I think that's, I think at, at this point, that's what's available and that's what we would be able to sort of leverage. Thank you. And I'll follow on with that just to clarify on the aerial surveys. So I'm, I'm aware of Normando Associates, APEM. They have uh, a really nice digital aerial photography database where they have uh, AI go through and identify anything larger than a buoy that is not ocean conditions. And then they have a two-step QA, QC process on top of that, where one person goes through and identifies what they think it is, and then another person comes in and validates that identification. So, you know, I think there's a, a big push to streamline those sorts of processes, to, you know, narrow the scope to species of interest. You can fairly easily distinguish the shape of a manta ray from, say, a large whale or a boat those sorts of things. So I think at least that first pass of AI machine learning 
for someone with an aptitude towards it could be uh, fairly useful. There probably still need to be quite a bit of QA QC in the beginning um, until your training database got big enough. But it'd be a really interesting application of that skill set and certainly something that's going to become more and more marketable in the future. Uh, I have two questions. Um, my name is Yao Zhuolin. I'm in the life sciences department. Uh, I'm relatively naive for to computer vision and the machine learning. So my question is, but I'm a biologist. So if we can provide you as like a phone experts, uh, we can provide you like a well labeled at the species level training data sets. How many, like what's the magnitude of the image uh, that we can provide for you to get an accurate um, estimate from the AI algorithm? Like how many correctly labeled down to the species level? Uh, because this requires lots of efforts. Um, but if you give me like a number, like a thousand, what, what's the number for the training data sets that you feel comfortable that the, you can build a model to identify at down to the species level? Uh, that's, a, uh, that's a difficult question because uh, to, to be honest with you, I am a biologist and I'm not. Um, that um, I don't I don't create AI ML algorithms I don't, I don't do the coding and that type of stuff so um, I am not exactly sure what that number would be I would imagine it would be and again I think it depends on uh, obviously accuracy and I think initial data sets is going to be I mean we, we would be lucky to probably get within the hundreds um, for an initial data set um, and then obviously as we refine the model and hopefully get more and more training imagery you know hopefully we can get up into the thousands but um i don't uh, i i it's it would be hard for me to put put a number on that great thank you i, I have a follow-up question i'm actually i don't study animals i study phytoplankton in the ocean but we have very, very similar uh problems uh there is a field in study plankton they use imaging data but more of a microscopic uh imaging data try to classify them into different species or just to estimate the diversity uh i think one solution the for the plankton people find is they they find it's too labor intensive for like each person to try to build a um, library of identified image and they do this like now as a crowdsource. So it's called the Ecotexa. Um, I think it was initiated by like a French group but now it's like more international. They just put it online and everyone can like upload their image and there will be like qualified scientists with expertise to label the image. And eventually when it accumulates to enough um, uh, amount, they apply and build models on that. I think maybe this could be something uh, of interest to the larger megafauna group too. It's called the Ecotaxa. Yeah, I think you're absolutely right. And I think that's, that's the, the direction that a lot of areas are going. I know for, um, like w one of our groups within our center does a lot of underwater imagery. We have like an entire an entire reef fish survey that's based around underwater imagery, and uh, we're plugged into a couple of the different um, databases. Like uh, Fathom, I think FathomNet is one of the newer ones. Yes, I I actually yeah. talked to one of them. Yeah, they're computer science people. Yeah, yeah. So um, I know that currently, like FathomNet does not include aerial imagery or satellite imagery hopefully in the future i think that i think that they're working towards aerial imagery now mm -hmm. uh, but hopefully yeah there, there will be more and more of sort of these crowdsourcing large repositories for satellite imagery going into the future that i don't think that those really currently exist but no i think i think that that's that's a good point and that's a good a good you know potential future direction is to sort of build to crowdsource some of these these imageries and these annotations. That would be exciting. Thank you. 
Just to add on to that real briefly that, uh, you know, general rule of thumb for AI training seems to be that you need at least 100 images to build a class data set. Um, and to provide some hope that that would actually be relatively easy to generate for giant man arrays, we have our colleagues at NASA who just went through uh, Google Earth imagery from, you know, a single time period around Cape Canaveral where we have a fairly large aggregation of mantas. And just as kind of a back of the envelope thing, they pulled together 23 confirmed images from kind of one Google Earth image from, you know, maybe a few, maybe 100 kilometers of coastline. Um, so I think it can be done fairly quickly to get it off the ground, which bodes well for a student project. <laughs> first. Um, have, has anyone thought of, because uh, I know you mentioned the bias of you can only, mostly only see it when they're at the surface, so you only see the ones when they're at the surface, possibly using something like sonar mixed with a model that looks at how manta rays move in relation to other things of similar size, so that you can get kind of an idea of how many are at depth or when they're at depth, just to try to broaden your data set. Yeah, so for the distribution modeling part of things, our, our easiest, lowest cost way of finding out where mantas are is having people who are out flying counting whales also count mantas. So it's completely opportunistic. The whales get almost all of the money. Um, and so anyway, that's gone very well for us. We were able to pull together you know, decades of aerial surveys for marine mammals um, and get manta ray data out of that. So now with the satellite tags placing those on the, the mantas, we can actually you know, get some of that depth use data. We have had uh, divers working in the Gulf of Mexico who use sonar to evaluate whether mantas are in the area and then check and make sure that they've gone before they send their dive teams down because these guys have the uh, extended hoses. They're at 300 plus feet of depth operating and we have had some interactions between mantas and divers that have been concerning for the safety of the divers um, with those hoses, because if they get entangled and pull the diver up, that's a real bad day for the diver. Um, and so seeing those sonar images, you could at least categorize things as being a large ray. It would be difficult to confirm that they're a giant manta ray. There are a few co-occurring species that are kind of similar dimension. So. I think the satellite tags at this point are probably the most cost-effective way of getting that information, but it is, you know, opportunity cost of getting out there, finding a manta, cost of the tag, and then the odds of getting a tag on the back of a manta have made it a slow progress so far. But it is a lot of fun. Remy. Um, hello, um, I have a question regarding the uh, data acquisition, um, like everybody else. Um, so um, for the data acquisition, have you thought about using the 3D um, satellite tracking data to kind of refine the pool of images that you're using to um, then identify, positively identify um, manta rays from the satellite data? So you know the depth and the position in, um, of the manta ray, and then using satellite data, if it overlaps with that time point, to then um, build a better data set. Now I know um, you're tracking, I think it was N equals to three, right? Manta rays? Well, how many? We're around like 12 or so at this point, okay. but they're fairly large probability ellipses for position because that's based on a, a maximum likelihood estimation process that uses sunrise and sunset times as recorded by the tag, so luminosity measures along with uh, pressure sensors so it can figure out what depth the animal was at at the sunrise sunset time to estimate latitude of the ray. So, and then sea surface temperature because it has an on-depth temperature sensor to kind of interpolate what the most likely position is. So yes, working in tandem with that, you know, saying within this area, we're confident there was a manta on the surface sometime during that day. Maybe you caught it with that snapshot of a photograph, maybe you didn't, but, it would be a nice self-feeding process in that if you were able to find the manta in that satellite photo, you could identify its exact position, feed that back into the estimation model, which then would improve the estimation model, which gives me better data on the satellite tracking side of things. So I like the synergy there for sure. Yeah. Um, 
And then, you know, the other resource that we have is we do have our entire sightings database, which is based on aerial sightings, ship-based sightings, personal sightings. So, you know, and they, you know, we have dates and times on those as well. So you could potentially get, like you're mentioning, search, you know, satellite imagery for you know, if it's, if the dates and times overlap, you could potentially look for, you know, at those sightings as well. Um, yeah, we have about 5,000 lat longed date stamped positions for manta rays from various types of surveys. And we know those were all at the server. Correct. Sorry, could you repeat that? We couldn't understand on our side. I think he was saying we know that those were at the surface. So it would it would be a good place to start in terms of building your validation set. You know how many of those corresponds to satellites, at least satellite tracks or potentially satellite imagery? So none of those would correspond, I mean, because that's all aerial and ship-based survey or anecdotal diver sightings or other things. Um, so what you would do is you would take that suite of 5,000 or some odd images um, or, or date stamp lat longs, and then you would search the satellite imagery for a similar location and see if you could find that animal in a satellite image from that day somewhere nearby. Now, you know, one of the issues that you're going to run into is that the synchrony of the timestamp, even if you know it was there on a given day, the odds of the aerial observer seeing it at the exact same time as the satellite took the picture, well, you know, that's pretty small, right? But to have it somewhere in that area during that day is fairly reasonable. And so then it comes down to an odd scheme of, well, what percentage are they spending at the surface? And, you know, they don't breathe air, so they're not obligated to come to the surface. But uh, they do tend to spend, especially in certain locations, quite a bit of time either basking at the surface, which I think is a metabolic thing where they're warming themselves to make their metabolism more efficient, or surface feeding, which we see uh, kind of like barge feeding is what we call it, where they'll log at the surface with their mouth kind of halfway out of the water and just let the gentle waves slosh food into their mouths. They're highly motivated, I think, to eat efficiently to maintain that massive body size off of a fairly limited, fairly small food resource. And a few more, a uh, few questions on the, on the date, on data set or strategy. E, would you be uh, more interested in students working with the general ocean anomaly detector. And because if, if you don't specifically look at the man, uh, giant manta rays, then the, the data set looks a lot better for, for training validation. Uh, and I'd agree that at least a hundred, a few hundred would then becomes very reasonable. But I, I, I don't know what the chances, I, I'd like for, for you to tell us what are the chances that there would be a few hundred manta rays. And if that seems doubtful, could a first step could be just a team working with the, the general open anomaly detector and possibly be broader in, in the, the targeted uh, detection? Yeah, and I think you could potentially do, especially if you're talking about a team, you could potentially do some of that in tandem. So you could do some of the things like we've been talking about with taking our known sighting database and seeing if some of the satellite imagery overlaps and, and then perhaps seeing if you can actually find imagery that contains manta rays and compile the data set that way. But then if you also had the, the general ocean anomalies sort of detector running that at the same time, or you could do them, you know, separately, because if you were able to have, you know, build a training data set without the ocean anomaly detector, you wouldn't have to weed through all of the other stuff that you're going to have to get with the ocean anomaly detector. Um, I, I don't know right now that we have a specific preference. It would, that's be, you know, uh, we could certainly talk about what the, the best method moving forward would be. 
And the data sets uh, were ocean wide uh, all around the world, or are there specific parts of our oceans that you're focusing on, like the Gulf of Mexico or Atlantic Ocean? So our specific focus would be, um, you know, the Southeast region for sure. Um, we had sort of singled out the flower gardens at first because that is sort of a, um, a an important area for this species. And we definitely know that they occur there uh, with some regularity. So we had um, discussed focusing on that area, but um, Again, ultimately, you know, this is something that could be applied, you know, more widely, even globally, because this uh, this species does have a global distribution. But specifically, because we work in the southeast, sort of our focus is is within that that region, um, at least to, to begin with. I, that's that sounds good. If if there's going to be enough meta rays in the in the data set. <laughs> Do you, in terms of computational uh, power, do you have an idea of, of what kind of, uh, uh, you, you probably need GPUs to, to run the general ocean anomaly detector? I would imagine, yes. Again, I'm, I'm not, I'm not a, a, I'm a biologist, so I don't, I don't, I don't know in general, but yes, I, I, I would, I would think so. Yeah, thanks. That very, very cool problem. Raymond. Yeah. Um, my next question, I apologize, this is going to be an AI question, but on the uh, previous code that's been used for identifying the whales, do you know if it was um, raw code or were they building upon an, a pre existing AI image analysis software? For example, for my um, uh, AI projects that I just started for image analysis, I've been using uh, YOLO V8. Um, do you know if you're using something like that? That I do not know the specifics of. No, I, I apologize. But I could I could find them out. All right, excellent conversation. Well, let me, uh, I'm a chemist. I I'm Shifting Hu, by the way, a um, chemical photographer working at the university. Um, so a couple questions, uh, maybe pretty naive. The first one is you have 5,000 uh, images. Do you have a, a time range? Like uh, were they taken, you know, in 10 years, five years or a couple of years? Yeah, so for those 5,000, we don't necessarily have all of the images associated with them, but we have confirmed sightings from people who are trained. Um, unfortunately, for you know our validation purposes, not a lot of the aerial surveys retain photos or, or take photos. There are a few groups that do aerial digital imagery rather than having a human observer, and then they go back and retrospectively analyze the uh, the digital photos. And then some of our aerial survey teams do take photos um, from time to time. So we have those, but I think the, the key would be for your training data, data set is, uh, as another student had suggested was overlapping, you know, knowing that there was a manta on the surface at some point on that day near this general location. So at least narrowing your scope of search to see if it shows up in the satellite image. And like I said, I mean, it, you know, I was a little skeptical this would work well, but then our colleagues from NASA pulled out 23 from Google Earth from a single day's photo um, fairly quickly, you know? And so it seems like actually, if you look at the times where they're most heavily aggregated, you could probably put together a fairly big training data set. The, uh, the surface appearances at flower gardens in particular might be a little trickier. Um, there is a very high concentration uh, or a relatively high concentration off kind of the crow's foot of Louisiana as well. And that is an area of active interest for NOAA fisheries because we have a good deal of interactions with our shrimp trawlers and giant manta rays in that area, which don't often end very well for the manta rays. And so it would be uh, very interesting to create, you know, something that was a little more proactive and predictive um, and informative, where if you got a satellite data set trained up where you could get almost real-time notice of what areas giant manta rays are located in 
and then inform the fishery as to those are areas where your bycatch probability is higher today versus others. Um, maybe we could do some adaptive dynamic management that would reduce some pretty adverse consequences for giant manta rays. So there's another nice kind of conservation angle to this process that could, could happen if uh, someone were successful in making it uh, you know, a reality. And also for the satellite imagery, um, I would presume, you know, all the images that used for this type of correlation uh, has to be like in the cloudless phase, right, without cover, cloud cover, and also, uh, you know, cannot be too strong in the wave action, so to speak, like, you know, reflection may be different. Yeah, I mean, anything measured with a satellite has its limitations. The, you know, fortunately, sea surface temperature stuff, you can get through the clouds with that. So the, those data tend to work out fairly well. Chlorophyll A is hard to measure with cloud cover. So I've run into that from the distribution modeling perspective where daily chlorophyll A is almost useless. Eight day averages tend to fill in most of the gaps. So for aerial stuff, you're going to run into those same issues where, you know, Certain days in certain areas because of cloud cover are not going to be useful, um, mm -hmm. but you know that that'll be easy to eliminate and not eat up a lot of computational time if the area is obscured. Hopefully, that's a first pass right there through the uh, the coding process, and you just toss that and move on to the next. Okay. Uh, also, the my next question, the uh, next question is, uh, what do you think? You know, like physical model output be any useful, like icon. Thing. Sorry, I missed that one. It's a high con, you know, the physical uh, orthographic modeling output. Would that be anything useful for this type of uh, project? Um, you know, I think that that would be kind of a secondary step where once you've got, uh, you know, a list of sightings, you know, like if you built up a good database of sightings, it could, could be combined with the aerial survey sightings. And then you could look at different types of, you know, modeling processes to account for, okay, well, now we know where they are. So then the next big question is, well, why? Why are they there? And then HICOM could be useful for that. You could also use HICOM output, you know, if, if it turned out to be faster, which I kind of doubt, but if it turned out to be faster to eliminate certain days and areas entirely because of HICOM output saying that, you know, there's crazy wave action in this area, so it's not worth looking at um, on that day. But I suspect you'd be able to whittle that out pretty quickly with uh, the training on the aerial imagery and not have to download and work with the HICOM data, which is also big files, kind of difficult to extract data from. Yeah, so we're all busy. <laughs> All right. Any further questions? Yeah. I, I, out of curiosity, I, I've seen at times large schools of rays uh, on our coast here near Corpus Christi. Those are probably not the endangered one. They were like a light brown rays school. What is that? It's a cat nose ray. I'm not gonna know. I'm not a biologist at all. <laughs> okay. You can get thousands of them in congregations in the bay. Okay, that's what I saw. Yeah, I was stunned by how many there were. Yeah, I would say it would be more likely a count us. We have had um sightings, confirmed sightings of giant manta rays off some of the jetties in Texas, though. So they do occur, but not in, they're one-offs and they're pretty rare. So to add to that, do manta rays also experience migrations where they kind of all come together? And if so, um, from the ones that you do have tags on, would you be able to notice where they're going to go possibly tag some more? Because you know there's going to be a high concentration of them there during migration. Yeah, so I don't know if we know for sure migration versus, you know, we do have some areas where we do tend to see aggregations that form somewhat predictably. Um, I think the big one among those is off of, off of Cape Canaveral, um, kind of around this time of year, each year. Um, and it seems to be driven by sea surface temperature and kind of when the water temperature is right, 
There tend to be big aggregations. Our aerial survey team was out uh, a couple of days ago and saw 100 manta rays on a single aerial survey, which is just nuts. Um, a lot of times what we'll try to do is put out a spot tag, which is a, a tag that has fast lock GPS on it um, on the first one out there. And then you can use that guy to tell you where his friends are over the next couple of days. And you can tag them with the, the mini pat tags after that or the acoustic tags. Um, also, you can use the species distribution model or just a sea surface temperature and frontal gradient model to predict fairly accurately where they're going to be. Um, these guys like to gather along frontal gradients. They like to see, you know, they like to be where the phytoplankton are, the zooplankton are. Um, <clears throat> our modeling capacity or knowledge of zooplankton distributions is fairly limited. I think NASA does have a new satellite going online starting in 2027 scheduled that'll have a phytoplankton measurement on board, which will be super exciting for us because that's a good proxy then for zooplankton, which is then a good proxy for giant manta rays. So, you know, classic endangered species research where you're, you know, six steps away from the actual thing you're trying to measure, but you're doing the best that you can. Would, would a high resolution sea surface temperature model be a, a good input to the DA to the machine learning? Is it already the case? Yeah, I mean, certainly we have, you know, with that scientific reports paper that I and my colleagues put out, we've got, you know, a pretty good predictive model that has been kind of validated by practical experience over and over again after the fact. Um, the one limiting factor for that from a forward predictive perspective is like I said, chlorophyll A is a pain and you've got to wait kind of eight days plus however long it takes the NASA teams to aggregate that data and provide it. So you're always, you know, uh, probably two weeks to three weeks out from when you're actually on the water trying to make a prediction. But we've, we've found that sea surface temperature and sea surface temperature frontal gradients are a big driver for that predictive process. And so, yes, you can use those in like a next day, 9 a.m., looking back at yesterday kind of perspective. And certainly if you were going through and trying to generate training data, then you could use the full model to go through and, and make predictions as to where you should be looking for the training data. Um, but again, I feel like you'd probably be done with that if you went through the 5,000 some odd known points and look for those, you could probably get your 100 plus images from there without having to resort to predictive modeling with the uncertainty around that. That's pretty good, you, but you could also overlay the, the, the maps. Uh, you could have pixels from the satellite imagery and pixels from the uh, sea surface temperature and go into a 3D conv convolutional neural net that has worked for other cases. If yeah. If it's difficult, the man, it's, it feels like it's not an easy problem. <laughs> Just say. Yeah, I mean, working with the sea surface temperature data is easy. Um, I've got that all coded out, and it's the NOAA has made it very, very easy to access that information. So that that one, if you wanted to try that, certainly we could make that happen. You know, getting the aerial imagery, making sure somebody had access to that, and then going through and cooking up the training imagery. I think those will be the big lifts. And then, you know, making sure we have access to the appropriate level of high performance computing to actually, you know, run the process at a large scale. Um, well, for uh, this is a technical question, very uh, simple one. So to for the students to, to conduct this type of uh, um, AI and uh, analysis, uh, what type of a platform do they need? Programming and, uh, you know, computing power wise. That's, uh, that's a good question. Um, and another one that I don't have a specific answer for there are, you know, some, and it really depends on, I think, um, how deep it goes and how much of it is done locally. A lot of stuff uh, we're moving into the cloud or trying to move into the cloud to do a lot of it. Um, 
so I know that, you know, some of it can be done on, you know, a local high powered sort of laptop, but then, you know, at some point, you know, you have to move some of it into, depending on how, you know, how large the, the, the files are and, and that type of stuff you might have to move into, um, you know, something with quite a bit more computer computing you know, power and capacity. So, but I'm not sure of the exact, you know, parameters for that. Again, that's, that's not exactly my, my area. Summer PC is ramping up a new high performance uh, cluster. Um, that should be, that should be pretty good. Uh, oh, I would think likely sufficient for there's <laughs> so do they need to program or just uh, the code is provided they can make modifications oh. I bet I bet they would be oh uh, to, to access that you, oh, you, uh, you need uh, general anomaly detector I bet they would need to to know how to train it they, they're probably I'm guessing there would be a github repository they would download it uh, um, there's good chance that be TensorFlow based, and that you would need to know the libraries, and then um, then there's gonna there would be, uh, and I'll, I'll ask Christian to to correct, but and there's a good chance that quite a bit of time will be spent with assembling the uh, the image imagery database, and then uh, uploading it, and and you know trying trying to see what kind of architecture or or keep the same architecture, but but interact with it. And uh, find the right hyperparameters for from NRAs uh, with the like image resolution that you wrote there. Would that uh, be like consistent or different resolutions? But the image that was shown you, you had probably several pixels there. A pixel. So I would think if if you can if you can see it, you need to see it with a human eye. Sure. And if you can see if, you, if there's several pixels in a in a human eye and and you have hundreds of them. And there's a good shot, I think. So I have a question. This is Dorina from Gulaven Faculty uh, here at MSCC. And this is completely out of my uh, expertise. But uh, just going back to the computational needs, and um, will will there be someone, if, if the students decide to engage in this research question with you, will there be someone on your end uh, that has those kind the kind of knowledge uh, required, like what you, uh, Jinping and, and Philippe were just talking about, that they can get their answer from uh, at NOAA there. Yes, uh, absolutely. So um, we sort of represent the biologist side of, of most of this, but I, I do have colleagues that, and all of those projects that I sort of outlined in that first slide that is sort of tangential to this, um, I work closely with a lot of the people that are involved with all of those types of things. So certainly the people that are more sort of in, involved and in line with the actual uh, AI, ML, technical side of things, uh, we would certainly bring them in to consult and they can answer questions and, and be in contact with the, any of the students that might be involved, for sure. Great, thank you. If there was a group of students, uh, a student or a group of students interested in, in doing it, would like a biweekly uh, uh, meeting every couple of weeks with, uh, with specialists on your side, with, on the AI, ML, and biology side, be, be possible? It's something I found that to work pretty well. I can, I can certainly say that I could make myself available from the biology side of things. Um, and I... Uh, I'm sure that I could pull somebody in absolutely the, um, the AI ML, the more technical side of things for sure. I did want to say that um, I, as to some of the questions about what's been done and some of the more technical aspects, of course, this is just kind of a review paper, but I did post something in the chat. I don't know if all of you can see it or not, but um, there is, that's a sort of an overview by uh, Kristen Kahn, who is the main, um, author there she's the one that's sort of been leading that Gaia project that sort of has been doing a lot of the North Atlantic right whale and, and beluga stuff up to this point um, so that's that's a good sort of I think 
maybe baseline foundational article on what's be, been done so far um, and sort of the steps they've been taking. I have a, a kind of more biology based question. So I remember uh, you guys showed these kind of like the density uh, based on like the time of the year and stuff. And I've actually had what I think was an interaction with the manta ray over at one of the jetties uh, in the past, which is like a really memorable moment. But I remember it happened during the time of like major mullet migrations kind of coming in and out. So it was, you know, super productive, a bunch of stuff going on. Um, and then in following years, I heard about my buddies that, that also saw them along other jetties uh, along the coast. Do you guys often see like co-migration or kind of linked behavior between other species that you guys also monitor? Yeah, I think we, uh, you know, jury might be still a little bit out on that. I mean, the giant manta ray is feeding on zooplankton, mullet are feeding on similar things on the surface. Although if it's a mullet run, they might not be feeding so much as migrating to reproduce or whatever. But if they're creating pelagic eggs, mantas do like pelagic eggs. Um, so maybe they're queuing in on that. You know, these are all sorts of good questions that would be something that would be really fun to learn more about. Certainly have seen reports of them and, and videos, you know, in the news coming out of Texas from the Freeport and Galveston piers in particular. Um, so they're, they're there. And, you know, a lot of times where there's one manta ray, there's likely to be another nearby, um, particularly kind of the coastal situation. So, yeah. So and a quick follow up on that. Uh, you so you guys don't think that they're likely eating those mullet? Because I, I feel like when I was watching them swim, that they were just like <laughs> inhaling all these finger mullet, but maybe not. Um, well, I mean, I guess it depends on what size mullet you're talking about. I mean, a, a giant manta ray's ability to eat things is fairly limited in terms of size. So they're, they're eating fairly small zooplankton, maybe the occasional very small fish, euphausids, copepods. You know, that's that's sort of their bread and butter. They they get it caught in their gill rakers and then sort of swallow after pressing the water out. Cool. Thank you. Yep. I'll share with the, the students that uh, probably several of us have worked with NOAA fisheries and like, uh, I work with Robert Hardy, Stacey Hargrove on sea turtle conservation, so different different species, but it's been very, uh, very good interactions. So yeah, thank you. Thank you. Good. Good team to work with. Anybody else? Any questions? Um... I th if you are okay with us reaching um, out to you, maybe as the students start thinking about their projects and uh, have more questions, we will follow up with you. Um, that's the plan. Um, but for now, looks like we have, uh, do you have questions for the students? I guess that is really important for, for us to, uh, to know if you would like to learn a little bit more about them or uh, or their interests? Yeah, I mean, I'll, I'll tell you. So we did uh, something somewhat similar uh, last year with a CEM student from Duke University where we had her working with her advisor and um, they were able to categorize mangrove nearshore, um, you know, categorization from aerial imagery. And that turned out to be a really useful input for a distribution model I was working on for small tooth sawfish, which is a species that is listed as endangered under the ESA. And uh, we're working on a, a publication with her now, and she's currently working as a GIS specialist for NOAA's NCOS after having graduated from Duke. So, I mean, this is certainly a, you know, a good way to get a sense of what type of work NOAA does, um, help the agency with an important conservation question um, we're certainly really excited to, to work with y'all. So, you know, the way that that process worked was we did sort of a similar call for proposal. You know, we had a problem 
does anyone want to help us solve it? And she had reached out, sent us her resume, and we looked it over, talked with her a little bit about expectations, and, and that worked out very well. This one, I think, is one leap further than that in terms of complexity and you know, us as the three presenters not necessarily having the entire background that you would need. So we would have to pull more people on, but certainly if you're interested, please reach out to us. We're very interested in getting the answer to this. The agency in general and the US government in general are heavily invested in making AI and machine learning a reality. And NOAA in general is very interested in making those huge investments in satellites pay off for any number of questions. And this is a really cool question which could be extended if successful to a lot of different marine species. I mean, anything that comes near the surface could be useful here. And as Christian mentioned, it's not just the marine species, it's the boats. And uh, you know, from an ANOA enforcement perspective, closed areas and seeing boats fishing in closed areas from satellite imagery is another thing that NOAA would be really interested in generating in the long run. So this is going to be a very active field of development for decades to come, and the data is just going to keep getting better as the eye in the sky gets better and better. So really exciting to have you guys get in on the ground level on this. Um, so if you're interested, please reach out and we'll try to make something happen. Thank you. Everybody good? Okay. We thank everybody for attending today and uh, we will stay in touch. Oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Bye. Thank you all for the time and for your questions. They were really thoughtful and helpful for us to even kind of get a clearer vision of what we're trying to accomplish. So thank you very much. Bye.